Good evening, everyone. My name is Russ Gannum, and I am Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs at the University of Iowa. It is my privilege for me to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Dr. Timothy Snyder, Richard C. Levin Professor of History at Yale University. Professor Snyder's talk is entitled History and Freedom, the Past, Present, and Future of Tyranny. Many of us have long admired Professor Snyder's work. He is a public intellectual whose scholarship is respected not just in academic circles, but in the mainstream media and popular culture as well. Professor Snyder's research is especially relevant as political tension spreads across the globe. His work helps us understand authoritarian movements and threats to democracy worldwide. Professor Snyder's lecture tonight is sponsored by the Ida Cornelia Beam Distinguished Visiting Professorships Program. The Ida Beam professorships are designed to provoke intellectual stimulation across campus. And in this case, they serve to promote free academic inquiry into issues of global importance. Before closing, please let me thank you, the audience, for participating in tonight's event. Please let me also thank our event staff and international programs, Joan Kerr, Sir Walter Peterson, Amy Green, Ben Partridge and Amy Brewster in particular for their help in organizing tonight's webinar. Please also let me extend deep thanks to my colleague, Rosemary Scullion of the University of Iowa's French and Italian department, whose diligence in bringing Professor Snyder here tonight deserves our warmest appreciation. And with that, I will ask Rosemary to give a more formal introduction of Professor Snyder and this evening's presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Russ. Uh, let me welcome those of you who are joining us from the University of Iowa campus and from other uh, locations around the country and perhaps from abroad. Before introducing Professor Snyder, I'd like to echo Russ's comments here in expressing my deep gratitude to the team of professionals on staff and international programs who've provided the vital technical support and outreach resources that have enabled tonight's gathering. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the contributions of other entities and individuals here at the University of Iowa who have contributed along the way to making this visit happen, including first the Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professorship Program, and then the Department of French and Italian, the Division of World Languages, Literatures and Cultures, and the European Studies Group. I'd also like to thank UIW staff members, Jane Matchick and her colleagues, Beth Millinger, Rebecca Triton, and Roseanne, Roseanne Santa Domingo have also lent crucial assistance at various stages of fundraising and administrative planning, as did three key administrators to whom I would like to extend here warm and heartfelt thanks. At key moments over several years time, now Associate Provost Russ Gannam, Interim Chair of French and Italian, Ana Rodriguez Rodriguez, and Jill Beckman, current director of the Division of World Languages, Literatures and Cultures, all cheered on my efforts and made sure that through the twists and turns of the COVID crisis, that the project of bringing Professor Snyder to our campus would not be derailed. I'd li also like to thank Professor Snyder for accepting our nomination for the Ida Beam Distinguished Visiting Professorship. And last but not least, thanks also to his assistants, Daniel Fedorowicz, who graciously and with endless good humor worked with me as we adapted over an extended period of time to the planning challenges that the pandemic presented. Now, in the last decade, liberal democracies across the Western world have seen the rise and spread of white nationalist populist movements that have rocked the status quo, propelling forces of organized hate out of the shado shadowy margins and even ever closer to the mainstream of political life. These developments have been especially alarming to scholars specializing in the history of 20th century Europe, who observe striking parallels between our fraught contemporary circumstances and the conditions that spurred the rise of authoritarian regimes in the interwar years, unleashing the genocidal forces that ravaged the European continent during World War II. One of, and many would say the most compelling and accomplished of these scholars is our guest this evening, Professor Timothy Snyder, a world-renowned public intellectual who among numerous other distinction, holds the Levin Professor of History at Yale University, the Philippe Romain Chair at the London School of Economics, the Baron Fell chair, chair at the Université Libre in Brussels, the Fleginga Chair at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and he is a permanent resident fellow at, and is a permanent fellowship at the Institute for the Human Sciences in Vienna.
Professor Snyder's deep knowledge of 20th century Europe's totalitarian moment has made him one of today's most sought after analysts of the anti-democratic forces now threatening pluralistic societies the world over. He has published widely on European history, including numerous books in which he studied the vast conflict zone that opened up in Central and Eastern Europe during and following World War I, when several of the regime's imperial monarchies collapsed under the weight of military catastrophe and sclerotic elite rule. In Bloodlands, Europe Between History and Stalin, published in 2010, Professor Snyder performed a critical and analytical tour de force by examining in excruciating detail the commonalities between the mass murder that Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler committed in Eastern Europe between 1930 and 1945, which claimed 14 million civilian lives. In his subsequent work, Black Earth, published in 2015, Professor Snyder issued a stark warning to the contemporary world in demonstrating that the murderous energies the Nazi regime unleashed on Europe during World War II were not an aberration of history, but rather an indicator of the frightful possibilities available to human societies that are haunted by the specter of dwindling resources and gripped by the terror of existential demise, which they imagine it portends. In another recent work, The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, and America, published in 2018, Professor Snyder also once again marshaled his vast knowledge of Central and Eastern European history in ways that speak powerfully to our political present. Here, he instructs readers on the historical roots of the ideology that has shaped the political vision and the authoritarian ways that current Russian President Vladimir Putin has adopted in seeking to assert his influence on the global stage a project that is predicated on the enfeebling of liberal democracies and on the unraveling of post-war alliances that have kept the peace in Europe for 75 years. In recent years, Professor Snyder has become a prominent figure in our national media culture as some of the most visible and influential journalistic outlets in the country have turned to him time and again for understanding of the roiling political dramas that are stoking widespread fear about the weakening of democratic norms and the destabilizing institutions that are the bedrock of constitutional self-rule. In early 2017, Professor Snyder authored a small book titled On Tyranny, a 20-point guidebook that, inform that was informed by the lessons of 20th century European history that called on readers to resist the authoritarian impulses now coursing through numerous polities around the globe, where democracies increasingly, increasingly hang in the balance. On Tyranny shot to the top of bestseller lists in the US and quickly became the topic of vigorous debate around the globe, but also notably in Europe, where a resurgent and swaggering far right has recently made stunning electoral strides unseen since the end of World War II. In the Washington Post, Carlos Lozada explained the importance of this small gem of historical and political insight, describing On Tyranny as, I quote, a slim book that fits alongside your pocket constitution and is only slightly less vital, further calling it, quote, a memorable work that is grounded in history, yet imbued with the fierce urgency of now. The stunning success of On Tyranny has had, has, since, has had since 2017 will no doubt be extended in its newly released graphic edition, which has brought on board illustrator Nora Krug. Professor Snyder's scholarly and intellectual achievements are not just distinguished, but truly exceptional, as are the vital contributions he has made in recent years through his exemplary practice of an engaged humanities in which he has shared his immense knowledge, immense knowledge about the European past in the broader public sphere. In recalling the history that points to the perils he sees us now facing, Professor Snyder has advanced one simple and incontrovertible truth that should call to attention all those who embrace the notion of rule by consent, that democracies, however long lived, cannot be taken for granted. They are, he says, he has shown, and I'm quoting him here, quote, precious and exceptional. Let me give you now Professor Timothy Snyder, who will help us understand more fully why this is the case. Please welcome Professor Snyder. Okay, thank you, Professor Scully and um, Provost Genem. Thank you, thank you very much for these very kind introductions. Um, I, it's, I, I'm very, I'm very grateful uh, for Professor Scullion's introduction of my work. I, I fear only that she's promising much more than I can really deliver in 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 the forty five minutes or so I have with you. 
What I'd like to do um, after acknowledging my debt of gratitude to, to my colleagues at the University of Iowa for, for this invitation, what I'd like to do is, is to begin a certain kind of conversation um, because any discussion about freedom, and this is gonna be a discussion about freedom, can't just be um, a list of symptoms of, of a disease. We, we can't just be talking about tyranny. We can't just be talking about how things have gone wrong. We also have to have some sense of what it is that we're trying to protect. In other words, the historical work uh, to which Professor Scullion kindly refers, in, in which I describe, for example, uh, Nazi German or Stalinist atrocities is very important. The, the diagnostic work that I like to think that I did with On Tyranny and other recent, and other recent publications about what it is that's going wrong right now and how perhaps we should resist it, maybe that's important too. But the real challenge, I think, as we, as we look into the future is to try to understand just what freedom is, uh, just what it is that we think is good and valuable and worth, and worth protecting. So that's where I wanna start. And the reason why I say this has to be a dialogue is that whatever freedom is, it's gonna depend upon different individual combinations of values. And so the discussion that we have after this lecture is gonna be as important to me or maybe more important than, than, than the lecture itself. Okay, so let me, let me begin with the problem. Um, and here, of course, I agree completely with Professor Scullion's um, analysis. We have a major problem with freedom or with democracy, pretty much however we choose to define it. If we define freedom and democracy on a global scale, pretty much every reputable source, beginning with Freedom House, can tell us that democracy or the rule of law, if you prefer, has been in retreat for the past 15 years. If we look at matters on the scale of our own national politics, the picture is similarly bleak. Um, in, 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 to my way of seeing things, the United States of America never quite attained the status of being a full democracy. And in the last decade or so, on across a number of dimensions, we've been pulling back. If we were talking about a foreign country, we would have no difficulty in saying what I'm about to say, although I think we sometimes do have a hard time saying it. We've just faced a pres presidential election, which was contested by violence. And I think it's more than 50% likely that our next presidential election will also be contested by violence. If we look at freedom on an individual scale, if you look around at our fellow Americans, especially at the younger generation to whom a lot of these thoughts are going to be directed, uh, it's hard to say that people are enjoying lives of freedom. Um, it's, it's hard, it would be hard to make the claim that y young people, especially those who've grown up or started university in these last couple of years of COVID, could name freedom um, as one of their major experiences of life. Again, I, I hope I can hear from students who will comment on this, but that's, that's, that's my sense of the matter. So let me start with this issue of what freedom actually is, uh, because it seems to me that we have to start with that before we can move on to the question of how, it's, how it would be threatened or what's, what's most essential, what's, what's, what's common to the various threats to freedom. So for, for me, and again, this is of course up for discussion, but for me, um, freedom has, must have to do with, with values. It must have to do with the essentially human things that we bring into the world around us. It must have to do with the unpredictable ethics or the unpredictable aesthetics that arise within us and which we seek to impose on the cold, predictable universe outside of us. Freedom must have to do with that. It must have to do with our ability to imagine the world at least slightly different from the way that it is now. It must have to do with our ability to think of the should and not just apprehend the is. And in addition to the imagination, in addition to the combinations of values, freedom must also have to do with the realization of at least some of these values, at least some of the time. If I can imagine a different world, but I'm absolutely powerless to realize it across all scales from the personal to the political, then I also can't be a free person. If, if, if my freedom is trapped only in my own mind, if I can't actually affect the course of my own life or the lives of those around me, if I have no voice in, in my own polity or own society, I'm, I certainly can't be free. Now, if freedom means something like that, then the next question that arises would be, 
what does freedom need? What does freedom require? And this, for me, this question is absolutely essential because again, referring to, I think a very, a very astute remark that Professor Scullion made about democracy, I'll now apply it to freedom. Freedom isn't just out there. Freedom is by no means the default condition of, of human beings. Um, freedom is not an adjective or not a noun that one would use um, in application to most of human history or, or, or prehistory. There are no outside forces or internal forces. There is no destiny. There's nothing that makes us free, right? Freedom has requirements. And it seems to me that if, if my definition of freedom is right, if freedom is about our ability in the present to imagine values, to evaluate the world, to change the world, to, to realize some of our imagined versions of the world, if that's what freedom actually is, then what, then what freedom needs, uh, perhaps first of all, is a future, right? Freedom needs the future. And this, I mean, as we look around at the rise of authoritarianism or the decline of democracy around the world, this I think is perhaps the common denominator, the futurelessness of it all. That no one, um, whether it's in China, um, whether it's in America, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Turkey, uh, whether it's in Iran or in Hungary, none of these aspiring or successful authoritarians have a vision of the future. And this is striking because in the history of politics for the, at least the past 200 years, the future has occupied a very important, it's like occupied a central place in the political imagination, but, but, but no longer, right? No longer. It's as though, I mean, and this seems to me to be a key, the doing away with the future seems to have something to do with the doing away of, of democracy. And I think, I, think that's, I think that's actually a causal relationship because when, when I ask the question, what does freedom need if freedom needs a future, then here we, here we can go in an unexpected direction. If freedom needs a future, then it also needs a past, right? And this is, this is the other thing that we see is very common, again, across authoritarian movements and across authoritarian charismatic personalities, is the, in, the end of historical time and its transformation into some kind of myth of innocence, right? Some kind of myth about when we were innocent and the others were the ones who, who carried out harm. Some kind of myth about when the country used to be great um, and all that is necessary to restore its greatness is to get rid of those people who somehow did it harm. What I wanna suggest is then is that freedom, and this is a very simple claim, um, but it's not the kind of thing that one usually encounters, I think, in our political discourse. Freedom requires historical time. Democracy requires historical time. We need a past that we know something about. We need a past which allows us to take responsibility. We need a past whose structures we can competently see in order to seize upon them, apply our values, our ideas to them, and to imagine a different future, right? That's what, that's, that's what freedom needs. Freedom needs historical time. And by extension, freedom needs history. So when I titled this talk, History and Freedom, I didn't mean that I was gonna describe the history of freedom. That's not what I'm gonna do. Instead, I'm gonna make the argument that freedom needs history, that freedom needs history, that freedom requires history. Okay. To, to try to clarify this, I'm going to spend the next, uh, the next few minutes, the next portion of this talk, trying to describe what it's like to live without history. And in some special sense, this part of the talk is, is, is dedicated to um, students or to people who are, let's say, under the age of 30. Because in this part of the talk, what I'm going to try to describe are the modes of time um, the, the, the kinds of temporal politics that have dominated the last 30 years or so in the United States, but also I think to a large extent in, in the rest of the world. What, I, what I'm gonna be saying here is that there are ideas of time, which when we live in them seem perfectly self-evident and natural. They don't seem like something that one can question. And yet that these forms of time have a kind of politics deep inside them, and that this politics strongly determines, strongly constrains just how free we can be. Okay, let me stop being so general and give you some examples of what I mean. 
the, the first form of, of the politics of time um, that I think has moved us, Americans and others, away from freedom and towards authoritarianism is what I would call the politics of inevitability. Now, the politics of inevitability is, is the first form of time that I'm going to describe, which is not history. Okay, so this is my point all along that when we have when we have wrenched ourselves out of historical time and into other forms of time, other political forms of time, we have made it harder, much harder for democracy and freedom to thrive. So the first form is the politics of inevitability. Now, once I describe this, it's going to seem very familiar. Um, the politics of inevitability is the idea, especially after 1989, that there was only one way that the future could go. That you know, to choose to, to, to cite Maggie Thatcher, that there are no alternatives. Now that communism has fallen, capitalism is the only thing left. And that's a very good thing because capitalism must inevitably, so the thinking went, capitalism must inevitably bring about freedom. Capitalism must inevitably bring about democracy, right? This was a very powerful way of thinking. It went under the title, the end of history or the lack of alternatives. Its critics called it neoliberalism. Um, this, the, the, the problems with this are, 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 are I think, pretty obvious. If it, that is, if you really care about freedom, right? I mean, the basic problem is that if you really care about freedom, the idea that freedom is going to be brought to you by some larger force should be immediately suspect. You know, you can like capitalism, you can not like capitalism, but the idea that capitalism is going to deliver freedom is on its face impossible and indeed authoritarian, right? Because the moment that you, you accept that something else, some larger agency is bringing you freedom, you're not a free person. Because freedom is something, if my definition of freedom is right, freedom is something that you have to be going after on your own. It has to have to do with your own values, your own ability to apprehend the past and try to imagine a different, a different future. Another problem with these politics of inevitability is that it defined, it, it defined since there's only one possible future and that one possible future is good, then suddenly all questions of values become irrelevant. Right? This is Think about how this works. If capitalism is automatically bringing democracy and freedom and everything good, then suddenly there's no need to think hard about what good actually is, which is the traditional task of the humanities. So in the period of the politics of inevitability after 1989, the humanities suddenly don't matter. And you know this is visible across, this is a challenge that universities have faced in these last 30 years. Since we know what's going to happen, the humanities don't matter, values don't matter. We don't have to talk about what's good or think about what's good because the good is gonna be delivered to us by larger forces, right? On a silver platter, so to speak. And in this way of thinking, here comes the next problem. No problems are not moral problems. Problems are only technical, right? Since, since we know what the future is gonna be, it's just our job to make it come about faster with the right techniques. Um, and you know, as we as as we follow down this line of analysis, it's very easy to then think, well, okay, all problems are technical, and therefore all techniques are solutions. So, therefore, for example, the internet must be somehow be politically progressive because it's a technique, right? Social media must be politically progressive because it's a technique, and of course, that turns out not to be the case at all, right? It turns out to be the case that the internet and in particular social media are politically very regressive, indeed authoritarian. And I would, I would go so far as to say they tend towards rather strongly towards the fascist. So the politics of inevitability by now has largely worn itself out. Um, at some point, you know, the, these ideas are going to crash. They, they can crash when one realizes what the internet actually does. They can crash at the moment when you understand that believing that capitalism automatically brings about a better future um, tends, to, tends to create the kind of capitalism that doesn't bring a better future, an unrestricted capitalism uh, which, which restrains social mobility. So a capitalism which leads, as it has, for example, in the United States, to huge differences in wealth and huge differences in income is a capitalism that is hindering social mobility. And what is social mobility? Social mobility is precisely the is precisely the capacity in one life 
to have a predictable and perhaps improved future, right? Social mobility is a form of freedom. Social mobility means that young people can follow their own values into a life that's different from their parents and sustain that life, right? Social mobility in the United States is much, much lower now than it was in 1989. So in these various ways, the politics of inevitability crashes for different points to different people. But I think you know, it's fair to say that somewhere around you know, by the 2010s, this way of thinking was giving way to something else. And that something else is what I would call the politics of eternity. So again, like the politics of inevitability, this is a way of moving through life. This is a way of moving through time, which seems normal. It's a, it's a politics of time, which, shape, which shapes everything else. It, it, it defines the parameters of what's normal, what's normal to think, what's normal to say, what's normal, what's normal to, to expect. But it too, like the, like the politics of inevitability, but even more radically, pushes us away from democracy and pushes us away from freedom. The politics of inevitability, I would say, in the politics of inevitability, this idea that larger forces are going to bring us all the good things, I would say that was pre-authoritarian. That whole idea, you know, which it felt like freedom at the time, didn't it, right? The fall of the Berlin Wall and so on. But I think that that notion that there was only one possible future was, was pre-authoritarian because it did away with a lot of the mental habits and a lot of the moral habits that we would have needed in order to be a free people. The politics of eternity is much more openly authoritarian. The politics of eternity, which has been you know, quite important since the 2010s, um, is, is the idea that there's really not a future at all. So, you know, it's a kind of natural successor to the politics of inevitability. The politics of inevitability trains us to think there's just one future. It's a good future. It's inevitable. All the work is being done by someone else for us. And then the moment when that goes away, right, the moment when you realize social mobility is gone, or the moment when there is a terrible unexpected epidemic, or the moment when the person who you really didn't think could be president becomes president, whatever the moment is, if there was only one future there for you and you're shocked, that future goes away and you're left with zero, right? And that's the politics of eternity. The politics of eternity, instead of seeing time as like a line moving forward to a better future, the politics of eternity presents time as a kind of cycle. The same things happen over and over again. We are always innocent. They're always guilty. There was a time in the past when our country was pure. Uh, it was great. And that time has been spoiled. This very simple idea is present from Orban in Hungary to Kaczynski in Poland in a very strong form um, in, in the actions and ideology of Mr. Putin in, in Russia. It's also very present in recent presidential politics in the United States. Uh, and and what, it, what it holds um, is, is, is an interesting kind of extension of the politics inevitability. You had one future and now it goes down to zero. Um, the politics of inevitability said that values don't really matter. In the politics of eternity, suddenly the only value that matters is identity. Who is us and who is them? Everything is about the us and the them. The value, we don't really have to define who we are or why we are good. We only exist in opposition to the other. And that very opposition is the only value. Our ability to define ourselves against someone else is the closest thing we come to a kind of moral discussion. That's, that's, really, that's really all that's left. And then in another interesting way, the politics of eternity extends the politics of inevitability, and that has to do with facts. So in the politics of inevitability, people pretend to care about the facts. Right, the politics of inevitability is is dominated by basically by economists or fake economists who pretend to care about the facts, but what they're really doing is they're kind of gathering up the facts and forcing them into this story about how everything is getting better. Right. So in the politics of inevitability, let's say for example that there's a little thing going on called global warming. You just say, well, you know, we're we'll we'll solve it somehow or there's a little thing going on like massive wealth inequality. And you say, well, wealth inequality is only a sign of how well capitalism is actually going, right? You work these facts into a story, right? The story dominates the facts. The facts don't matter at all on their own. The politics of eternity takes that to its next logical level. In the politics of eternity, you say facts don't matter. 
facts don't matter. I have my truth. You have your truth. You have your opinion. I have my opinion. Everything is equally valid, which is to say that nothing is actually valid. And of course, this enables a certain kind of post-truth politics, um, which again, we see around the world very strongly in Russia, most recently quite strongly in the United States. Um, and in this, and in this, uh, in this dogma of anti-factuality, you also see a very specific danger, a very specific danger, um, you know, not to exaggerate, but a very specific danger, not just to our politics, but, but to our survival. And that is the denial of, this, of, of the science of global warming. So whereas the politics of inevitability, you know, said, oh, there's global warming, but we'll probably find a technical fix for it. By the time you get to the politics of eternity, pretty much every single politician of eternity, and again, this is an interesting global rule, denies that global warming is happening, or in some cases, actually aff directly affirm global warming and say that it might not be such a bad thing. But either way, whether you're denying the science of global warming or whether you're thinking it might not be such a bad thing, you are de facto a pro-global warming politician. So in that sense, the politics of eternity is authoritarian and it's pre-catastrophic. So what it leads to and where we are moving now is something that I would call the politics of catastrophe. So again, the, this is a form of thinking about time, which is starting to seem normal. And we're, we're starting to inhabit this form of time. It, it again, like the other forms of, of temporal politics, it constrains what we can think and what we can see and how we talk to one another. Um, and I'm trying to name it partly so we can see it, see it for what it is, um, you know, see it historically and maybe think our way out of it. But the politics of catastrophe, what it's what it's doing is that it's following the same logical progression. So in the politics of inevitability, there was only one, there was only one future, we knew what it was. In the politics of eternity, there was no, there's the future, it leaves the discussion. There's really no future, right? I mean, the, the striking thing about aspiring and, 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 and successful authoritarians is that they have done away with the future. In the politics of catastrophe, the future is negative, right? The future is, is a disaster which is coming for us in the present, right? The politics of eternity brings this out or makes it more likely or hastens it with its anti-factuality. Because when you oppose the factual world, uh, opposing the factual world doesn't make the factual world stop, right? You can't use your propaganda against carbon dioxide. The globe will continue to warm whether you believe that it's going to or not, right? There are, there are in fact regularities of physics which are immune um, to our fact-free preferences. So the politics of eternity brings about a politics of catastrophe by accelerating global warming. And what happens there, since of course, everyone actually does know that global warming is real, even the people who deny it, um, what happens then is that the future starts to colonize the present, right? The future begins to take over the present. It becomes very hard to talk about the present because the disaster in the future is, is looming ever larger in our sensibility. In, in our imagination. Now, this can take two forms, and it does. The first form, which I would say is you know, more characteristic of the left, is to fear the ecological crisis itself, um, to be aware of the ecological crisis, to name it by its name, um, to speak of other species, right? To think of the, to speak of the ecosphere uh, uh, on its own, to talk about it in the ecological terms. That's perfectly reasonable. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it which, and now Professor Scullion has already suggested this theme and I'm gonna to return to it. Another way of looking at this is to not look at the ecological catastrophe as such, but to start talking about racial competition. And this is already happening in the United States and elsewhere. This, the people who deny global warming, they may claim not to believe in global warming, but they're getting ever more um, excited by the idea of racial competition of one race crowding out another race, of demographic success and, and, and failure, right? This whole idea of replacement is a kind of competitive catastrophe with global warming. And it has very much to do with it, right? It's, it's like, it's replacing the, the, the physical and predictable ecological crisis with a subjective um, and highly emotive uh, political crisis in which we say, we blot out the fact that we're making life unlivable for everybody and focus our attention on the people, this is where it gets interesting, on the people who are harmed first. So if you, 
the, the way that this functions, um, you know, grosso modo, is that instead of talking about climate change, you, you talk about your fear that your race is going to be outnumbered. And kind of magically, 2040 is the same date for both crises, right? 2040 is about the time when global warming will get completely out of hand and we can say goodbye to the species. But then for other people, 2040 is the time in the United States where there isn't going to be a white majority anymore, right? And that then becomes the catastrophe. That's the competitive catastrophe. That's how this works grosso modo conceptually. But the way it works in politics is with immigration, right? Because what, what is the root cause of South to North migration? Whether it's in Europe, whether it's the United States, the root cause of South to North migration is global warming. The, the more global warming we have, the more South to North migration there's going to be. It'll be mediated by wars and conflicts. I realize that. But the, the root cause is going to be the, 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 ever, the, the ever greater difficulty of living in certain climates, right? And interestingly, this is not only a South to North issue, it's also a Muslim Christian issue because most of the territories that are gonna get hard, hit hardest by global warming in the next 20 years are places inhabited by, by Muslims, which is something we're thinking about. So the way this comes, the way this works out as politics is that rather than talking about global warming as the root cause of migration, we talk about the migrants and we treat them as the threat, right? So we, we, we blame the victims in a very sophisticated way. And by blaming the victims, we, we recreate ourselves as innocent. And by recreating ourselves as innocent, we don't have to look at the catastrophe. And by not looking at the catastrophe, we, has it, we, we accelerate it, we, we, we bring it about. Um, we bring ourselves much closer to the world um, of, 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 political, of political atrocity. Okay, um, how can history help? So um, I, I've got a little bit of time left now for, for solutions. And what I wanna do is, 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 is speak in the broadest way um, and very sincerely about how I think history as, as a human commitment and as, um, a, as a way of being in the world can address all of this and, and heal a lot of it. So one way, that history can help. And remember, this is a talk about history and freedom. And so this is about how history can liberate us from, ide from other ideas of time, right? That history can get us out from under these oppressive ideas of time and maybe just maybe give us a shot at fixing the things that are making tyranny so, so dominant at the moment. So number one, uh, history can help because it allows us to historicize all of the things that I'm talking about, right? That's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to say, look, the politics of inevitability, of eternity, of catastrophe, these things are historically explicable. We can understand why they came about. They're not reality, right? They're not, they are, they're not in fact mental prisons in which we have to live. Once we can see how they came about and how they function, once we see their logic and their sources, then maybe we can mentally work our way out of them. And once we mentally work our way out of them, then, you know, then politics itself becomes much less dire. Number two, history can help us to realize patterns. So when I talk about these politics of inevitability and, and eternity and catastrophe, I'm, those are my words, those are new terms that I've made up, but th they, they describe not just particularities of contemporary America, they describe patterns, they describe things that one can look and see elsewhere. So for example, another form of the politics of inevitability is certain kinds of Marxism, right? Certain kinds of Marxism also said that, a certain, that, that economics inevitably leads to certain kinds of political outcomes, right? Another form of the politics of eternity was late communism. In late communism, I mean, the, the last decades of the Soviet Union, the emphasis was not on the, fu not on the future anymore, but on a kind of eternal present. Um, the way that late Soviet politics worked under Brezhnev was to not to look forward, but to look back at a time when the Soviet nation was great. That is to say, during the Second World War. And the politics of catastrophe, and Professor Scalene has already suggested this, but the politics of catastrophe are familiar to us from national socialism, from the Nazi experience. Because what Hitler did precisely was to define a, what he foresaw um, as, a, as an ecological catastrophe in racial terms. So in a historical moment where hunger and scarcity were actually much more familiar to people, including people in the West, um, or we now call the global North, uh, at, that, at, at that time, 
Hitler defined um, an ecological problem with scarcity, scarcity of resources in racial terms. You know, so Hitler explicitly, and, and this, is all, this is all in Mein Kampf, Hitler explicitly says the solution to scarcity, the solution to coming waves of hunger is to get out front, understand that you belong to a race and to realize that racial competition is the only thing that matters, that it's the only truth of the universe. It's the, it's the only truth of nature. Now, I'm not making a comparison, right? Comparisons are not really that interesting. I'm describing a historical reality and historical pattern and historical process and a, historic, and a historical susceptibility. We are also susceptible to that. As we see a crisis approaching us, we face the same two choices that Hitler described in Mein Kampf. We can try to address it as a universal problem that has technical solutions, or we can divide ourselves up into races and then say, you have to get out front and compete. And the only thing that matters is winning and the survival of the fittest, right? And of course, National Socialism adds, and anyone who tells you otherwise, anyone who tries to tell you that science will work, anyone who tries to tell you that values will work, those people are, are Jews. And I'm afraid um, that tendency is also on the rise. So the politics of, of catastrophe is something that we can recognize from history. So the second way that history helps is that history allows us to recognize patterns and recognizing patterns, and this is the third way history helps, recognizing patterns means the possibility of avoiding them. Insofar as we recognize things, we're not surprised by them. Insofar as we recognize things, we can get some purchase on them. Um, we can avoid the moment of surprise. And in, instead we can use that moment when we might've been surprised to start thinking about how we can take action. And then the final way that history can help us, and this is the most, the most commonsensical, um, and, but maybe the most fundamental, is that history involves the common sense notion that there is a past, uh, that there is a present, and there is a future, that um, history reminds us that no matter, no matter how much we insist on it, there isn't only one possible future. There are lots of possible futures because there's tremendous variety in the past. And that tremendous variety in the past creates the building blocks, the, the, the necessary conditions, not for one future, but for many, many other, many possible futures. Uh, history tells us that there, there, there isn't zero futures, right? History tells us that there's a multitude of futures. And history also tells us that even when catastrophe seems inevitable, or even when people are in much worse positions than we are now, there are ways out. There are escapes. Um, so history gives us the com a common sense notion of how time flows, which can break through these, these, three, different, these three different versions of, 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 of time, these three different politics of time. Um, and history also helps us towards freedom in another way which is by forcing us to acknowledge individual responsibility. What do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that if we see ourselves in the politics of inevitability, we don't have any responsibility. Larger forces are bringing us freedom, that's great. It's being delivered to us on a platter. All we have to do is wait at our tables. The waiter is gonna bring it to us. In the politics of eternity, we're also not responsible because everything's about us and them. And we are right because they are wrong. So we never have to think about what it means to be right and wrong. We never have to exercise our individual catastrophe, our individual capacity for reason or for evaluation. In the politics of catastrophe, there's also no responsibility. You know, if, if the world is ending, then naturally I must do terrible things, A, B, C, and, and D, right? So no one's gonna be free or responsible at the, at the end of the world. What history does is, is that it grounds us. It says, look, if we know about the past, if we know about the structures of the past, insofar as we know about the structures of the past, we have some ability to transform those structures. Some, maybe it's a tiny, tiny amount of ability, but we have some ability to transform those structures. Insofar as we know, we are, we are responsible, right? And res that sense of responsibility is the, is the handmaiden of freedom. That sense of responsibility goes along with freedom because freedom is, is, is the notion that I am able to transform the future. So history gives a sense of responsibility and the sense of responsibility helps us to be free. But I wanna close um, by, by, drawing this, by drawing this argument to what I hope is its logical conclusion and to suggest that um, freedom 
if it's about the future, freedom, if it's about understanding history and thinking of time historically rather than politically, if, if freedom is about the future and if, if freedom is about time in the way that I've tried to describe, that does actually suggest um, certain kinds of actions that we should be taking now. Now, the actions that I'm gonna mention are, can be justified in various ways and are justified in various ways, but they're almost never justified in terms of, of freedom. So what I, what I hope to do by the time I reach the end, and I'm getting, I'm getting close now, is to have made the argument that a number of things which might seem like good ideas on a number of grounds are also, are also essentially about the preservation and the extension of freedom in the United States and, and around the world. So to, to, to warm up for this, let's just, let's just return to, let's just, let's just remind ourselves what, what, what freedom has to be on, on, on my argument. Freedom, um, freedom cannot be a gift of larger processes. The politics of inevitability is wrong. Freedom cannot be something which is gifted to us by, let's say, capitalism. Freedom cannot be gifted to us by some large impersonal abstraction, which um, it pleases us to see in the world around us. If freedom is freedom, it's not a gift. It's something which we have to seize. Um, freedom can't be a result of predictable processes, in part because it must be unpredictable. If it's not unpredictable, it's not freedom. Freedom arises from the unpredictable combinations of values that each individual holds differently from every other individual, right? So freedom is not a gift of larger processes. Also, freedom is not a birthright. So um, right-wing authoritarians, um, politicians of eternity might talk about freedom. They might use the word quite a lot, right? Um, but the way that they use the word suggests that freedom is something that you inherit. Freedom is something that you have. You are free just because you're an American, or you're free just because you are a Hungarian or a Russian. Don't think too hard about what freedom actually means, uh, what it actually entails. Just, just accept that because you wave the right flag, you are, you are a free person. But freedom can't be a birthright. Freedom can't be inherited any more than it can be received as, as a gift. I think here we, we fundamentally, I mean, very often anyway, in the US, we fundamentally misread the founding fathers here. I think the founding fathers would be appalled if they saw that 240 years later, we are going back to them and saying we're free because of, of magical things that they did. Um, I mean, Supreme Court justices and others talk about originalism, which I think is just intellectually um, on its face grotesque because the, the founding thought, because of what originalism says is that there's something, there's, there's a moment of unbroken, perfect innocence in the past, and all we must do is find that and follow it. The founding fathers would have found that absurd because the documents they wrote, including the constitution, were not past oriented. They were future oriented. Right? Their whole sensibility was directed towards the future. And if there's anything that they wished for us to understand, I think, from their political undertakings, including the Constitution, it was that future orientation. Right? And so this very tendency that we have to, to deify the founding fathers, right? or you know, to treat them as, like, as these kind of undead, you know, undead oracles of liberty, um, I think they would have found appalling. Anyway, that's just an annex to, my, to my, my point here that freedom is not a birthright. The moment you think it's a birthright, you're not a free person. If you think you're inheriting it, that means you're not free. And likewise, as I've already put it once, I think, no one's gonna be free at the end of the world. By the time we get to the politics of catastrophe, it's gonna be very hard for people to, to defend ideas of freedom because the, the, the apparent demands of the catastrophe will be, all, will, be, will be too great. So what then do we do in the present? to create you know, freely, to expand freely a sense of the future. How do we get away from these vicious circles where false ideas of time um, make us less free? And then when we are less free, we are more attracted to, more wedded to false ideas of time. That's the vicious circle that we're in now. We're moving from inevitability to eternity to catastrophe. How do we get out of that? 
my, my answer is that if we take freedom seriously and 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 we and, and we and we think about freedom as a project <laughs> that can only be realized with respect to the future there are a few things that we know that we should do now a few very fundamental things so the recognition that freedom is about the future this is not just an abstraction right because if freedom is about the future then suddenly we have to ask ourselves if we want to be free in the future how do we what, that and freedom is the highest value then what actions in the present must we take to make that possible so i'm just going to suggest a few um number one is that we have to remove insofar as possible the sense of catastrophe from our politics so in other words um in other words that, sorry that was my kid um, in other words, we, 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 have to, we have to do what we can to, to, to remove the specter of global warming, um, to remove the specter of climate change, because without that, it's very hard for the future to seem open. Now, I realize there are lots of arguments for preventing climate change, like, for example, preserving the species. But I would also say that free politics demands that. A second thing, which might seem you know, like a very good idea in general, um, but which, which isn't justified usually in terms of freedom, is massive reinvestment of resources in early childhood. So if freedom is about the future and freedom is about evaluation, freedom is about making choices, then in order to have free people, we have to, we have to invest in, in, in human life at the moment where we are most capable of gaining the capacities we need to do all of those things. In the last 30 years, a body of research has emerged, um, which makes it pretty clear just how important the first five years of life are. We almost never connect the first five years of, of life with freedom, but that's because we're not thinking about it in terms of the future. If we realize that freedom has to do with the future, then naturally we would say, we must make sure that children get all the attention, all of re all the resources, all of the time from adults that they need to develop the capacities that will allow them to be free. A third example um, is, uh, is the way we treat the digital world. So by now we know that the main, the main, or at least one of the major consequences of the social media medialization of everything is that it's made us as human beings more predictable, more predictable to the machines, also more predictable to one another. It's made politics more predictable. It's made voters more predictable. And the more predictable we are, the easier we are to manipulate. The more predictable we are, the less free we are in a couple of senses. We're less free because we're doing what we're led to do. Less free because someone or something else has, has, has brought out probably our worst and simplest elements. But also less free because human leaders um, uh, find it easier and easier to manipulate us. The more data there is about what, our, what buttons we have to be pushed, the easier we are to manipulate. Or to put it a different way, as our fears become uniform, um, you know, if you're, if you are, for example, a middle-aged white man and you fear the same thing as other middle-aged white men, then you as a class of people are, are, are manipulable by those who know what your fears are. So another thing which would be a good idea for a lot of reasons, but, but, but I think chiefly in terms of, uh, in terms of preserving freedom would be the de-digitalization of our private life in our public life. And I've written more elsewhere about how to do that, but just as a basic principle, try to restrain the reach of technologies that makes us more predictable. And then the final thing I'm gonna suggest here um, as, as a source of freedom would be the embrace of, of, uh, of the welfare state. Um, the embrace of a right to healthcare, for example, uh, an embrace of policies which make life um, more capable uh, of social mobility, right? Because that's what the welfare state was always about. The welfare state in the United States was always about social mobility. It served the purpose of social mobility. It was, it was the welfare state along with post-war prosperity, along with lots of hard work by individuals and entrepreneurs, but it was the welfare state which allowed for a period of American social mobility from the 1940s through the end of the 1970s. Since then, we've done away with it on various arguments, one of them being an argument from freedom, which I don't understand. Social mobility is a form of freedom. Um, if, if we, just as we need to remove the specter of, of climate change so that we can all see a future, 
just as we need to invest in early childhood education so that children can grow up knowing how to evaluate different futures, right? Just as we need to de-digitalize the public sphere so that we become less predictable, we also have to create a world in which young people can, can get up, leave home, and follow their own values and follow, and follow their own visions of what, of what their own individual future should be. So all of those are all examples of how, if we think about freedom in terms of the future, uh, if we inform ourselves historically, we cannot just um, analyze the past and critique the present, but we, we, we may also be in a position to prescribe what we should do now to make sure that we have a future, not just a future as a species, but a future as, as, as a free people. And if I can just, I'll just close on, on, one, on one political note. It's very striking in, in our country, in the United States, how one side of the political spectrum uses the word freedom quite a lot, but, but has very little notion of what freedom would be, right? So on the American right, we talk about freedom, but freedom just means freedom from stuff. Like I don't wanna wear a mask or whatever. And that's a basically empty notion of freedom. I mean, freedom has to mean freedom too. Freedom has to mean the ability to understand the world, to evaluate, to change, to realize, right? Freedom is not wearing a mask is trivial. That does, that's meaningless, right? But, you know, and in this whole idea that freedom is just, you know, nobody's gonna make me do something. Okay, fine, that's, that's, that's something. But much more important is what you're able to do how far you're able to see, how far you're able to throw your own influence, right? How far you're able to imagine things and realize them, that's freedom. But usually when we use the word freedom, we're using it in a very narrow and restricted sense. Nobody's gonna tell me what to do, I'm gonna follow my own impulses, right? That's very, very, very narrow. And then the people who propose the kinds of policies that I'm talking about, they usually don't use the word freedom. They might talk about justice or sustainability, but they don't usually refer to the value of freedom. So, I mean, my, my political hope and it may be a vain one, but my political hope is that we can bring these things together because I think the people who think that freedom is the highest value and who talk about it, they're absolutely right. I just think they need to talk about it in a richer way. And I think the people who are in favor of the welfare state and of, 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 of constraining um, the, the big social media companies and who are in favor of, of funding early childhood education, um, that, that the people who are against global warming, I think they're all right too. But, but the, the, the way that they're right is, never, is not usually articulated in terms of freedom. So I'm hopeful, and I think it's at least intellectually and morally possible that this notion that freedom is the highest value and this notion that we should be acting now in certain ways to make freedom possible, that perhaps those things could be, could be brought together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful um, um, uh, presentation on some very important issues that help, will help us uh, move forward into asking the questions about what freedom will mean for us in, in the future. And I'd like to start with one question here that is uh, that, that addresses this in a very practical way. And that is, um, uh, uh, thinkers have sometimes defined freedom and democracy as a practice. How do we as a society work on our democratic practice in order to expand freedom and open ourselves to the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question. I mean, First of all, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna emphasize my own point, which is that while freedom, while democracy is a practice, it, the, the, it's very hard to know what the practice is without a kind of prior insistence on values. So democracy means the people should rule, which is not a small claim at all, right? That's a very radical claim. It's, it's something which has almost never been, been, been realized. So the democracy is something that has to be practiced, but I think it can only, it can only be the, all the ways in which we have to practice it start to emerge when we see just how radical an idea it is. And so for me, one, one way to express how radical an idea it is, is to see what it does to daily life. So if the people rule, then that means, for example, that we all have to acknowledge one another as being part of the people. So it means that if it, all the things that I'm able to do politically, I have to simultaneously ask myself, are other people able to do those things politically? A good example here would be voting, right? So a lot of white Americans take for granted voting and they're a little bit puzzled that other people seem to find it difficult. Uh, one, of, one of our practices has to be, ref, I think, reflection about things like that. Another daily, another daily practice, which I think is very important when it comes to democracy, has to do with factuality. So if, if we rule, if the people are to rule, what is it that we rule? Where is that domain that we rule? And we don't know because 
most of the country is a news desert, right? It's impossible for the people to rule if the people don't know what they're ruling over. And this goes by lots of names. It goes under the name Facebook. It goes under the name disinformation. It goes under the name Russia influence campaign. But the root problem, and here's where practice comes in, is that we are not actually supporting an American informational network. Um, most counties in this country are now news deserts. The, the job of reporting local news in most of this country no, no longer exists. And so we have to, we have to find ways to, we have to find ways to make sure that information is, is generated, practically speaking. And then and then the third, third answer, which may go more towards the spirit of the question, it, it has to do with the kinds of things I wrote about in On Tyranny. I mean, On Tyranny is all about this. On Tyranny is largely about forms of, forms of moral or psychological or, or even physical action, which might seem you know, simple, um, like making eye contact or um, like, uh, like subscribing to that local newspaper or um, like uh, being not afraid to stand out in very small matters, like things that seem very small matters, not be afraid to feel a little bit strange, um, not normalizing, like an important idea in on tyranny, which is like one that's easy to say and then very hard to, to, to render in practice, is how, you, how we treat normal. Is normal what everybody else is doing or is normal what we regard as normal? And if we think normal is everything else that, pe that everyone, people are doing, which is how we, you know, as social animals, how we tend to behave, then we can't, then we can't have democracy because democracy depends on our ability to say, huh, actually this mass, this, this tendency of a mass to become a mob, you know, our tendency to become a herd, that will lead us away from democracy. You know, we have to say, to be democratic, we have to say, huh, actually I'm not with you guys right now because there are some, there are some rules. And that, that business of standing out, like seeing normal, not as what is, but what ought to be, that's, that's a form of practice, right? That's, a, that's something that you have, really have to work hard at. Could I just follow up on that? Oh, could you explain why subscribing to the Press Citizen or the Cedar Rapids Gazette or the Des Moines Register, why is that important? And what does that have to do with the larger structural elements of, of democracy in our country? Well, it's something that we know from, from research around, around the world, actually. I mean, it, that it, in Russia, local news went away. Um, about a decade before here. And so Russia serves as a kind of laboratory for what happens next. You know, local news goes away and then you have the consolidation of the production of information in a, in a, few, in a few places. Um, you know, one might say, oh, the internet's the answer to that because there's infinite information on the internet, but you know, no, there's not. Like try to find out whether your local water is polluted. You know, as someone has to actually go and do the measurements. You, if no one does the measurements, the, the internet can't help you. Um, the, the basic things, like the internet cannot tell you whether your school board is corrupt because the internet does not, go, does not you know, go the trouble of sitting through school board meetings. The internet cannot tell you what the city council just did. The internet cannot tell you these things on its own, right? The internet cannot report. The internet can only repeat. Only humans can report. And so the first part of the answer to that question is that we, in order to feel grounded in our local realities, we have to have people who are reporting our local realities back to us. And if we don't feel grounded in our local realities, then we jump onto levels which might seem comfortable, but are in fact um, really beyond our ken. They're really beyond what we, what we know, like national politics or international politics or conspiracy theories or you know, fiction or whatever it might be. But if we are grounded in local politics, then we're more likely to do a better job with the state politics and the national politics and so on. But also if we have local reporters, our whole attitude towards the media changes, right? We may not like local reporters. We may not like what they write about, like how our kid performed at the local basketball game. We may not like what they, we may not like that our water's polluted, you know, but nevertheless, a local reporter is a person. Once that person is gone, then all you have left is the media. And then you just, so then the, the, the move, and this is the move that most Americans now make, I think, is you say, I don't trust the media. But what you really mean is, I don't trust the media except for the people who are telling me exactly what I want to hear. And what the internet does is it enables you access 24 seven to the stuff that you want to hear. Right. And that you believe, right. You don't trust the media. You just stuff that you just, and, and so and that's the oldest problem. I mean, that's a problem that, you know, not, not with the internet, of course, but that's a problem that the, the, the ancient Greeks had already diagnosed that, that people are going, that democracy won't work because people are going to be drawn towards the stuff that they already, that they already want to hear. So local news keeps us grounded Local news gives us um, a, a better orientation towards, towards the media in general. And one more final thing, local news gives us stuff to talk about. 
which is not these abstractions or these national level things, right? When we do have school board meetings or city council meetings, we should be talking about like the schools and the, and the towns. We shouldn't be talking about national level issues, right? We shouldn't be feuding about national level issues. And that's what happens without local news, right? All, suddenly all of us like neighbors are oriented about something which might or might, not, might, have, might, or might not have happened in some different state. Um, and, and so for all, these, for, all these, for all these reasons, local news is really essential. Okay, um, I have a question here from one of our students. Uh, being a college student, I find what you discuss about our freedoms amongst the, gener the younger generation very interesting. As you stated, it is unlikely that we experienced freedom similar to other generations. Obviously, social media plays a major role in our lives. Could you further explain how the de-digitalization of the lives of the individuals allows us to seize freedom? Is, th is this goal achievable with the way in which media, social media have impacted younger generations' lives? I mean, that's, that's a deep and difficult question. And in the book about freedom that I'm writing now, I try to, it, it's structured partly as an argument, but partly as a kind of description of a life, you know, given what we know about child development and pedagogy and what we know actually about how social media is, is, is meant to work. So, I mean, the, on, on the negative side, and, and your students probably understand this often better than we do, but on the negative side, social media works by, by colonizing certain mental processes and, and sort of bringing them to the fore. So we are not just creatures who are addicted to you know, patterns of negative and positive reinforcement. We can do other kinds of things as well, but social media makes that part of us much more prominent. It feeds us the stuff we wanna hear, you know, along with some stuff that we're afraid of or terrified of, and that pattern draws us in, draws us in, draws us in. It makes it hard for us to put the phone away, right? As we all know, it's very hard to put the phone away. And, and so, and, and so that, that's a certain kind of education which um, you know, predictifies us. Uh, I think I made that word up, maybe somebody else did, but it makes us more predictable um, because you know, as the more predictable we are, the more saleable we are as a commodity. And that's what social media is about. It's about selling us as a commodity to advertisers. That's the negative side. The positive side is that you don't, it can, you can, you know, you can put it down. You know, the positive side is that, and, and I've actually been, I mean, over time, I, I have seen, I mean, I think the coming generation is, is, well, I shouldn't generalize like that, but I've seen more and, you know, more and more when I banned gadgets from my classroom in 2006, I was doing something with people, which people found strange. Now, when I ban gadget, gadgets, gadgets from my classroom, like most kids, totally understand why I'm doing that, right? And so there has been, there has been a shift in that direction. We, I, I think, I think the, there, there, there are two levels of the problem. And, you know, there's, there's the great American individual solution, which is you know, just don't ever keep your phone in a bedroom, you know, just never touch it last thing before you go to bed. Um, make sure you have books by you all the time. That individualism counts for a lot, but then there's also, there's also antitrust, right? These companies are just too big. And they've monopolized areas, which maybe you know what weren't thought of as areas to monopolize, but they have monopolized the areas. So this is a longer discussion, but I mean we have policy for this. We have antitrust policy, and it pretty clearly should should be applied um, in the in the interests of everyone concerned. Okay, I have another question here um, about the global warming. Can you elaborate on what it means to remove the specter of global warming from politics? That sounds hard. <laughs> Well, you have that. This is the, this is the great Hitlerian choice, right? And um, I'm just going to follow Professor Scullion's example and just you know use this as, as as the place where I keep Hitler in our discussion. What Hitler says is that that, that the future is coming for you. Right? Right. That's what that what Hitler says. The future is coming for you. Um, there's only so much to go around. There isn't enough for everybody. There's only going to be enough for the races who define themselves as such and exterminate the other races. And and says Hitler. That's just the way it goes. That's science, that's life, that's God, that's the universe, that's nature, that's everything. And anybody who, try, who tries to tell you something else, anybody who says, no, let's cooperate or no, let's do science, that person is a Jew, says Hitler, right? So the basic, the, 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 the fundament of, of Hitlerian antisemitism is the idea that there, there are values and there's science, okay? So the Hitlerian alternative is, do you go along, when you're facing a catastrophe, do you go that way? And that's the way that many of us are already drifting, right? Yeah. We're already drifting in that direction. Um, you know, the, just how just how many of us are, ha are are satisfied with survival of the fittest? I think we saw during during COVID, for example. Um, and and then, but then the other the other choice is no. Wait, there are values. Values right. are like real. Values, right? You've right? talked about like, that a lot elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like like survival isn't the only thing in the world. 
you know, there are other things besides survival. In fact, who cares about survival unless there's a world of values to live in, right? I mean, if the world really is about survival of the fittest, like what's so great about survival in that case? Because that's a world with, that's an empty world. That's a vacuum of a world. The other side says, you know, there are values and there is science. Science works. I mean, one of the things people forget about Mein Kampf is that Hitler specifically says, the science isn't going to solve the problem, Right. And that, for me, when I look at contemporary American life, like that's the thing which I find the eeriest, because you know we 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 like Germany in the 1930s, we are the most scientifically advanced country in the world, right? Just like Germany, and yet, like Germans in the 1930s, we have leaders who tell us, no, no, don't let's not let's not fund fusion, <laughs> let's not let's not fund alternative sources of energy, let's not do the things that we know could solve the problem. So when I say remove the specter of climate change from politics. I am saying something which I deeply believe, which is that we we there is no technical reason why we can't crush global warming. You know, technically there is no there's like this is not this is not a technically hard problem to solve. Um, it is not technically harder. It's probably technically easier than the, than the moon launch from the moment of Kennedy's speech to its realization. Our problems are political, and our problems are the stories that we're telling ourselves. So technically speaking, we could fund fusion. You know, we, we, the world spends half a trillion dollars at least subsidizing fossil fuels, right? And that's, that's the moral equivalent of spending half a trillion dollars subsidizing heroin. I mean, you, you, if we took a tiny proportion of that and we used it to subsidize solar, hydro, carbon collection, fusion, whatever, we could technically solve the problem, right? So we, when I say remove the specter, I mean solve the problem. We have to solve. We have to solve the problem, not just to survive, but also to make. Okay, I'm I'm going on for a while. Let's ask the next question. Sorry. No, no, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm saying the question is politically how to solve the problem. Right? Oh, okay. You're right. Uh, uh, that, yeah. I'm to that. Can I kind of say we're about that? I mean, I think politically, the way to solve the problem is to point out, and this is and this is like the the great tension of American political life. Like we complain all the time, but this could be a much better country than it is. Right. This is the thing which Agreed. is so frustrating. Agreed. Like. It's not, our choice is not between more or less erosion of democracy. Our choice is not between like more or less climate change. We could actually hit this one out of the park, right? Like we could solve global warming. We could do it. And then if we did that, things would be so much better, right? And that's the... That's, I think, the political solution. It's, it's, it's the, you know, and this is why like the tyrants do away with the future because some of the futures are really good. Right. And we have to be able to conjure with those futures that are really good in order to have better politics now. Well, thank you. I have one, a question here, and I, I believe it's, it's about the question of social uh, mobility. You spoke a little bit about the necessity of social mobility to, to enhance, enhance the chances of overcoming the politics of catastrophe and to be able to pursue freedom in the future. Do you think that this should be achieved solely by the ability to transcend and change your social status, the narrowing in on social classes, i.e. less difference between different social statuses and more equal footing, or some combination of both? Yeah, it's both. I mean, and they work together. So look, there's a long, all of us, all of us should be able to entertain and develop and realize our different values, including the, the including our versions of how we should live a life. And at and, and, and that level, it's all individual. But there's a structural issue here, which Plato saw when he talked about the two cities in the Republic which Raymond Aron talked about when he wrote that beyond a certain point, the rich and the poor can no longer communicate. Right. Orwell said almost the same thing in almost exactly the same words, right? This is not some kind of crazy left-wing point. The point is that, is that it, it, it's all individual, but if, you, if the structures are too forbidding, then, we as then a lot of us individuals are not gonna be able to make our way out into the world. So I am all in favor of a much richer and a much more interesting discussion of how one should live, right? And I'm kind of, and I'm counting on younger people for that. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, it's it's our job to clear away this 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 you know this this dead elephant on our chest, which is wealth inequality. Like, because that like no matter what your values are, if there's the structures are too much working against you, you're you're gonna, you're gonna be frustrated. Those values are gonna pervert themselves. You know, you're going to become a cynic. And, and so the two things, I think, have to work together. 
Okay, uh, you, you mentioned strategies to defend democracy against authoritarianism in your, in your book. Do you believe it is inevitable that our democratic country will one day fall to tyranny despite actively using strategies to defend against it? There are a number of questions along that line here, actually. Mm, I don't think, I mean, I, as I hope I made clear, I don't think anything is inevitable. And the more, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons why I like being a historian and I like talking about history is that the past is much richer than we think. And if the past is much richer than we think, that suggests something about the present, which is that the present contains more possibilities for the future than we're able to apprehend. So to, to make that point a different way, if you look back at any moment in the past and you look what people, what people predicted in that moment in the past, it's not just that their predictions are often wrong, it's that their predictions just often fail. They just are not even aiming at the right target, right? Like something completely different happens. Like it's not, the answer is not yes or no. It turns out to be purple or algae, you know? So, so, and, and so when I, when, when, when I ask a question about like my ability to predict the future, I try to remember that, that all kinds of other things can be happening. And some of them we don't even see because we just can't put all the pieces together the way that a historian can looking, looking back. So no, I don't think it's inevitable. What I, what I do think is that um, the, the, I think a couple of things. The first is that we have to be able to, we, we need right now, and I'm going to start writing about this soon, but we need right now to understand, you know, the, 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 the mainstream scenario that we're on. And the mainstream scenario that we're on is, is, is civil unrest after a presidential election in which the person who wins by 10 million votes um, is not, does not become the president, um, in which someone else is installed after chicanery, which we would criticize if it were being carried out in Africa, um, but which you know a lot of Americans think is normal. That, I, I, I don't have time to spell out every step of the scenario, although I will if somebody asks, but that's the, probably the most likely thing to happen in 2024, 2025. And we need to see that if we're gonna prevent it, right? The thing that we're not allowed to do is to say things are inevitable because then we don't do anything. And the other thing we're not allowed to do is to say, wow, it's surprising that stuff like this can happen in America. You know, because when you wait for the next surprise, then people just keep surprising you and you'll surprise your way, you know, into into a very deep form of, of authoritarianism. But no, I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's I think it's much more I think it's you know both much more likely than people think and that it's very much subject to, to human action. What would those human actions be? I'm trying to synthesize a number of questions because there seems to be an anxiety in the questions about what we can do as individuals and to, to have an impact to stop what many of us fear is coming down the road and to not fall into inevitability and say there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, num number one, I mean, so I guess my, my, my one answer I gave in the talk, yes. which is that I, we have to have a politics of the future like that. We have to, even though there's a, there's a specific threat in 2024, even though there's a specific threat of global warming and so on, we have to be, we have to be working from a future. Like we have to say like, actually, if we can get through 2024, things could really be fantastic. Like if we can get through global warming, things could really be wonderful. Like we have to have that. We can't just be against all the time. So like, that's the, cause if we're just against all the time, then we, you know, then, then, you know, it's hard, it's hard to love your country. Cause you're just against these people who are trying to destroy it. You know, you gotta be in favor of something and you gotta see a brighter future. And I, I, for one, honestly believe that we can get to a future, which is much, much better than the present and that we're and, and that we really can do that. But then, you know, tactically, and then for the next three years, we have to be looking at the particular things which are going wrong, which are, which are voter suppression laws, um, which are you know, the appointment of electoral officials who have basically promised not to count votes, um, which are various gambits by states, um, such as extra legal post-election counts, which are designed to run out the clock so the electors can't be, can't be named, um, which are states themselves claiming that they have the right to name who the electors are, regardless of what the vote is. All of those things are specifically designed to lead to a scenario where um, where the system doesn't work the way it's supposed to and where the president ends up being selected by something which is very, very, very far away from the popular vote. Once we know what, once we realize that all of these things which we know are happening are part of a, you know, part, part of a larger design, then we can know, then we can start thinking about how we oppose and reverse each of them individually. It's not gonna be enough to do 
you know, what, what people on the left sometimes do and say like, well, yeah, we've got more votes, you know, that's not really the issue, you know, I mean, the, the opponents of Putin also have more votes. Mm -hmm. um, what you, what you need to be able to do is to say, okay, these are the mechanisms, right? This is what the Russians call the administrative resource. This is how the administrative resource is going to work. And so we have to head this off, you know, before we get to 2024 as much as we can. So I think that can be done. I mean, it's kind of like the civil rights movement on a larger scale, you know, like all Americans have to have the right to vote. Um, everyone has to have the right to vote. We have to begin from the right, the right to vote, and then think of, you know, think of electoral chicanery as something which is un-American and which shouldn't, and which shouldn't be happening. We have another question here. Do you think the politics of the young progressive left buy into the politics of eternity too much? Or do you think that, as you mentioned, some of their policies related to the welfare state could be a potential solution given the right circumstances? I'm having, I don't know what, I'm not sure I know what the young progressive left is. I mean, my here, my take on the welfare state is that, um, and this, by the way, is consistent with the people who created the welfare state in post-war in post-war Europe and the post-war United States, is that it's all about the future. You know, the GI Bill was about the future. The the um, the, the, the 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 interstate highways were about the future. You know, yeah, they weren't exactly. about the past. Um, the, the, even, even something like social security is about the future. Like it's about your future as a, as a human being, right? It's about how you're going to be living after, after you retire. So I like, I guess, unlike people on the left, I don't think of the welfare state mainly in terms of justice. I think of it mainly in terms of freedom, because I think the welfare state is something which enables in, in, cause, cause if you can count on health insurance, if you can count on public schools, if you can count on a pension, then you have much more freedom in life and you're much more likely to get to those places you want, you want to get to. So that's, that's my, that's how I think the welfare state is meant is should be, should be thought about like as an, as an instrument of, of freedom. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, cause I'm not sure what the assumptions are here about what the young progressive left thinks. Um, I would also say that um, I think they're just rhetorically speaking, there's a Canadian social critic whose name is Henri Giraud who suggests, who doesn't speak about the welfare state, he speaks about the social state and the social state that emerged in the post-war era to, to, for equalizing wealth and the distributive possibilities of greater equality. And it's, I just think it's a, it's a more, um, it's precise de this definition of what is it's not I think well the notion of the welfare state has been vilified I think maybe if we change the language on that to raise the question of what is the function of the state in meeting the needs of the entire populace I think that we that, that he thinks that 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 language could be helpful okay so I have another question here to what extent should we as Americans feel threatened by online democracy attack particularly those emanating from the Russian Russian government well I mean that's that's that, that's what that was the reason why I wrote the the road to unfreedom. I mean that's what the road to unfreedom is basically about. It's about it's about. I mean at, at one level it's all about particular Russian attacks on Estonia and Georgia and um, Poland and then Ukraine very seriously and then the United States. Like I'm trying to tell a story about a certain form of Russian foreign policy, which has a logic, and the logic is that Russia can't solve problems at home. You know, this is another way that Russia, by the way, is interesting as a possible future of the U.S. Russia is an oligarchy. Russia is a country which is frozen um, because wealth is so unevenly distributed. Like it, it can't be reformed. And if you're the president of a country that can't be reformed, you look abroad. And what you do is you say, well, these countries might seem to be better, but actually they're not better. And I'm going to show you how they're not better by having lots of negative propaganda about them, you know, talking about how democracy is a joke. And I'm going to try to make democracy a joke which is what Russian foreign policy did. And I would say to great success, right? I mean, I, I am, I am not, not, uh, not me alone. I mean, Professor Jameson thinks this as well. Uh, a lot of uh, think that the, if it hadn't been for the Russian inter intervention, Mr. Trump probably wouldn't have won the election, right? If it hadn't been for the email drops, I think the way, the whole way that a lot of us saw the election would have been, would have been different. If you look back, for example, the second and third debates, the questions were driven by Russian email drops, right? And, the, and it was so close. So, but, it, but regardless of whether or not you think the Russians actually determined the outcome in 2016, it's clear that that kind of operation is very important. What I would note now is that the, like in so many things, the Russians were ahead of the game five years ago, but now what they do that did back then, everybody is doing. And so, and domestically too, right? And so the question becomes, you know, how do you, the question is more about how do you, how do you, how do you think about your own political commitments 
away from the things that are trying to reinforce and terrify you using algorithms, whether they come from Russia or whether they come from somewhere else. Okay, I have one more question here. Would, um, uh, do you think Hannah Arendt, having gone through the Hitler Zeit, got a lot of this? If that's a, is that, is that allowed to be a yes or no question? Because I can just say, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> yes, she, she did. I mean, I mean, I think Hannah Arendt, um, in Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, has, has a lot of this already down. Um, you know, in particular, she understands, like just to, give, just to give one example, she understands how important a story is that can absorb, you know, the facts and, and keep the story going. She, she understands very well what we, you know, what we call a narrative, right? Or, or what we sometimes call a conspiracy theory, like a story which is a lie which is too big to fail, basically, right? Like the idea that Mr. Trump won the elections that's a lie that's too big to fail. Like once you have, once you believe it, it's much less psychologically costly to just make everything else fit into that than it is to accept that maybe you've been lied to or maybe that's not the way the world actually is. So yeah, I mean, Arendt, I mean, the other thing that Arendt, now that I'm talking about Arendt, I mean, the other thing that she was, another thing she was very much attentive to was the problem of loneliness which is a way of understanding social media. I mean, she was very concerned with the way that modernity seemed to produce loneliness and loneliness seemed to produce, um, seemed to produce a kind of caricature of mass politics where like we all are fiendishly want to be together with a group, you know, maybe a racial group that we don't actually know, right? A politics, which is not about the, 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 the more difficult and challenging everyday corporeal encounters between people, but which is much less about how we, you know, imagining that we have a whole bunch of people who are somehow like us who are on our side, right? So she was concerned about loneliness. Um, and I think that like, not solitude, like not the ability to be alone, but loneliness, the inability to be alone um, and how, the, how, the, how that is produced and where that leads. So, I mean, for that and a host of other reasons, yeah, Hannah Arendt got a lot of this. Well, I think that we're going to, uh, 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 so Provost uh, Ganim is going to jump in now to um, take things over from here. Welcome um, back, Russ. Well, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, Professor Snyder. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, we've all been enriched by the, the, this dialogue. We look forward to your future work, Professor Snyder, and thank you, Rosemary, for engaging us in such a constructive and thought-provoking manner. I'd also like to thank the, the audience um, and to let you know that the discussion is not stopping here. Um, in that as a follow-up to Professor Snyder's lecture, international programs, the Department of French and Italian and the European Studies Group will host a round table of international experts for a discussion entitled Author Authoritarian Tendencies Across the Globe. This will take place a week from tomorrow, Thursday, December 9th at 2 p.m. Central Time via Zoom. I will serve as the moderator with our panelists discussing authoritarian movements in Europe, the Americas, Southeast Asia, We'll be covering topics such as election laws, human rights, misinformation campaigns, and social inequality as threat to democracy. And I would like to thank especially our colleagues in the departments of uh, sociology and political science for putting together the webinar that we will uh, host next week. And so with that, please let me thank uh, Professor Snyder and Rosemary once, once more. Uh, this uh, particular webinar will be archived on the International Program site, so you can view it again and study it. Um, and so, and I hope that you will indeed avail yourself of that opportunity. So with that, uh, let me thank the audience once again for its participation. And please let me wish you all a very pleasant good evening. Thank you. <laughs>